you, Father God, right now for your spirit. We thank you for ingratiating us with your presence. We applaud you, Father God, because you're worthy. We esteem you and we lift you up. So welcome into this place. We are your vessels to worship you, even with the instrument and the organ. With timbrel and dance and psaltery and harp, we lift you. We praise you. We magnify you. We glorify you. All in the name of Jesus. You are worthy of all honor, glory, and praise. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Precious members. 
Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Precious memories all seen angels said from somewhere to my soul they linger ever near me and the secret has unfolded precious memory justice, and dignity 
for African Americans that inspire so many others reform movements that seek to highlight the polite of the oppressed in society. We pray that all of those in civil and religious authority be reminded that we all have been created in your image and that it is an intrinsic dignity in each of us that calls for uplifting every man and woman, young and old. We pray that your Holy Spirit reminds us all that you have shown no partiality with regards to nationality, race, ethnicity, or gender. And to do so, to go against your great commandments of love towards one another. We pray that the church will not be complicit of injustice by being silent, but that it can rise up with a prophetic voice that speaks truth to power and advances the values of your kingdom. We pray these things in the name of our blessed Remedier, our soon coming King, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Ashe. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Jeffrey Wright. We will now have a pardon by the Reverend Gloria Lyons Smith. Father God, we believe you. We love you. We adore you. We ask that you pardon our sins, the sins of peace that endure. We ask that you forgive us and that we seek to sin no more. Go in peace. Your sins are pardoned. Amen. Thank you. Now we have a special Martin Luther King tribute and song by my daughter, Emily Williams. I have not heard her sing this song, but I can tell you that it will be amazing. <laughs> now, Emily <Thank> you. Williams. <laughs> Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy, happy Sunday. Happy Martin Luther King Day. What a blessed day that we get to celebrate such an iconic figure in our Black history and our American history. So I'm honored to be here and join you all today. Um, I was uh, requested to sing one of Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, favorite songs. And uh, it is, If I Can Help Somebody. <clears throat> If, if I can help somebody as I found so long, if I can cheer somebody with a word or a song, if I can show
unto the good society is realized. He said in his speech, I say very honestly that I never intended to become adjust to segregation, discrimination, and discrimination. Uh, hello, my name is Good morning, Good morning Church. My my name is O oh, my name is O oh, and I'm reading to Doctors Doc can speak VO Vietnam. Oh, a time to break the sun is well known because of the debate it sparked. He gave the anti venom speech when the country still supported the war. Dr. King received extreme blush back backlash, especially for attempting to unite the peace the peace movement with the civil rights move with the civil rights movement. Dr. King controls controls views caused him to lose many supporters, including African Americans followers. Many said this is the speech that made him a target as he was assassinated exactly one year later. We we are taking the black black young men who have been crippled by our society and sending and sending them eighty thousand miles eighty eight thousand miles from guaranteed liberty in so in Southeast Asia, which they have not found in Southwest Georgia and East Harmony. Dr. King said in his speech. Good morning, church. My name is Ibrahim and I'll be the third reader. In March 1965, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. marched with 25,000 people from Sel Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, to fight for African American voting rights. At the end of the march, the Reverend Dr. King gave his Our God is Marching On speech, which made, which marked a turning point in the civil rights movement. Instead of focusing on, a, on legal and political rights, Dr. King's speech promoted the movement to fight for economic equality. At the end of the speech, Dr. King used a call and response technique that made his that made this speech truly iconic. How long? Not long. Because no God can live for forever. How long? Not long. You shall reap what you sow. How long? Not long. How long? Not long. Because the art of the moral universe is wrong. But it bends towards justice, Dr. King said. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We always love it when our children are on the program. We're grateful for Dr. King and his word concerning African Americans. We are grateful because he was one of the leaders who helped them to where we are today as a people of African Americans. This is the end of the children's, of the narration of Dr. King's life. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. We always love it when the children are part of our program. And our children, they do such a wonderful job. And Sister, Sister Kylie playing the piano, wasn't that great? And the words that the, that the other three children brought to us was just simply insightful. We will now have our praise dance. We have a dancer in our congregation. And she is probably should be on the Alvin Ailey team. <laughs> she is marvelous. And we're going to bring Judith, Sister Judith Thorne Johnson, up for her dance, I Have a Dream speech.
primary concern. According to the 15th Amendment, in February 1870, African American men were given the right to vote. In communities of color or bilingual communities, there is an unsettling uncertainty about who we are and what our relevance is in this country. Some of our elders and a few of our young people have begun to question asking us, are we not citizens of the United States? Doesn't the law or the laws of protection cover all of us equally? Well, for the answer, first we must look down the tunnel of time. About 157 plus years ago, when the President of the United States was Abraham Lincoln. He, it was, they say, who put pen to paper to free the African American people who were enslaved in large numbers here in the United States. For those of you who are not familiar with the story, we, African Americans, became the labor force in this country mainly in the southern states. Lincoln signed a document known as the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. That was in the third year of this country's civil war. The Emancipation Proclamation declared that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are, and henceforward, shall be free. Later in the narrative of that document, it contained these words, listen carefully, and the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and they will maintain the freedom of such persons or any of them in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. We were supposed to have been protected by the military too. Once the formerly enslaved people were freed, they were confronted with an unsurmountable confusion. Some of them left the farms or plantations on which they had worked for years. Others found menial labor, for which they received meager wages. Some of them simply wandered without any direction. But you know what? Most of all, they thought they were free. White people were equally as confused. They didn't know what the protocol was for dealing with free Negroes. Full citizenship Negroes. What do you do with them? Congress generated the idea of reconstruction where whites and blacks could work together to help advance race relations. Southerners, white Southerners, didn't relate to this experiment. Blacks were being allowed to vote, and they were allowed to buy land, and almost be equal. Reconstruction soon degraded. It soon devolved into what we all know as Jim Crowism. In order to take back some of the liberties that had been extended to African Americans during Reconstruction, such as the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, which had granted African American men voting rights, not women, notice, but men, a slow and steady removal of freedoms and privileges were taken away. State and local laws were enacted that made racial segregation legal. And by the way, I'm saying state and local laws were enacted, not federal, that made racial segregation legal. These laws were made to prevent African Americans from voting, from getting jobs, to prevent equal educational opportunity, to prevent housing opportunities or any other American freedoms or opportunities. Even as far as travel was concerned, they wanted to impact that. In some states, it was legal to hang a person for little or no provocation. Jim Crowism existed or lasted openly in this country for about 100 years, from Reconstruction until about 1965. The legal system allowed the black codes 
of Jim Crowism and injustice to punish people of color in every aspect of life. Violence, by the way, was all a part of the plan. I think we recognize that. Homes were burned, women violated, children mistreated, and men mutilated. The Ku Klux Klan was started in 1865 in Tennessee as a, as a secret society to frighten and violate African Americans. African Americans then began to migrate northward, looking for relief. With many of the African American soldiers who had returned home from World War I and were returning home from World War II and telling of their positive experiences in Europe, African Americans began to seek more of their own civil rights. By 1948, President Harry S. Truman saw fit to integrate the military. By 1954, the Supreme Court ruled in an educational case that most of us know as Brown versus the Board of Education, stating that it was unconstitutional to segregate in public school educational settings. By 1964, President Lyndon Baines Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act in an attempt to quell the civil disturbances that he knew were about to occur from both black and white communities. People couldn't take much more. In 1965, the Voting Rights Act was enacted to prevent different locales from blocking the rights of African Americans to vote. A few years later, the fair housing laws were enacted, opening many more doors for African American habitation. We needed that help. Buzzing around us in the air somewhere, is still a question of, why is all this happening to us? Does God care? Let's, let's find out next week. Have a grand week. God bless. Thank you, Dr. Donna. I would suggest that all of you come back next week, next Sunday, to hear the rest of her talk about history and how it has affected us as African Americans. Uh, Dr. Dalla always comes with such information, such um, thought out information that she brings to us. And I'd like to just thank you for that, uh, Dr. Dalla. We will now have our scripture reading from our brother James Howard. Good morning. Today's scripture reading comes from Romans 12, verses 14 through 21. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind, one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lay in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Thus saith the Lord. Romans 12, verse 14 to 21. May the Lord add a blessing to his words. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much, Brother Howard. Now we have come to the point of hearing my other daughter sing. And she has chosen the song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. And 
Um, she, Aurelia is fabulous as well. She's been on Broadway, and we are very honored to have her here with us today to celebrate Martin Luther King's birthday. Thank you. Thank you, Mom. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, good morning, church. I'm so, so happy to see you all here and be a part of this celebration, not only this service, but this celebration. Um, but I just wanted to say a little something before I sing. Um, my mom told me that, um, that Reverend Smith suggested that I sing Precious Lord because it was one of Dr. King's favorite songs. And because I'm always looking for more things to learn about the world, um, I, I looked it up to see um, what, what was it about Precious Lord? And it turned out that he and Mahalia Jackson, Mahalia Jackson is one of the people who made, I'm sure you all know this, she, Precious Lord was brought to the mainstream with uh, Mahalia Jackson. And um, Dr. King and Mahalia Jackson had a wonderful friendship. And sometimes when he was at his lowest, he would call Mahalia Jackson up and she was singing Precious Lord to him over the phone. And in fact, um, at the, the March on Washington, she was such an inspiration to him that at the March on Washington, Dr. King had a speech prepared and he was delivering his speech and Mahalia Jackson was out in that crowd and she said, tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream. And he went off script. And I Have a Dream speech, which is arguably his most known speech, came from him, from his heart, but was inspired by his good friend, Mahalia Jackson. So if you would take a moment and imagine yourself in the shoes of Dr. Martin Luther King when he was going through all of his trials, going through some of those lowest moments, going through those times when his life was being threatened, and imagine your good friend singing to you over the phone. <clears throat> Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand, I am tired, Darkness appears. 
God's vessel. We should honor him for his service to mankind. He deserves every street named in his honor, every holiday that's lawfully observed, every prize that was awarded, every citation of merit given, every accolade uttered, every recognition imaginable for putting his life on the line for the causes that he fought so vigorously for. Yeah, yeah. I've shared this story with you before, but as a reminder, I need you to understand that some years ago, there appeared in a newspaper, the Black Chronicle, an article written and published November 1st, 1956, a captivating headline, along with a picture displaying an empty bus, which read 42,000 walk to work, boycott. 99% effective. And according to the article's account, Alabama blacks walked to work amid the drizzle of light rain that day in support of 87 of their leaders who had been indicted for conspiring to hinder, delay, and prevent the Montgomery City bus lines from carrying on a lawful business. Well, the massive boycott against segregated busing allowed blacks to save monetarily as well as to save their dignity, their pride, and their integrity. But better yet, the bus line lost nearly a million dollars in revenue. The indictments, according to the Reverend Ralph David Abernathy, made our people more determined than ever to hold out until our objectives are realized. They have arrested us for riding the buses, for not riding the buses, for driving our cars, and now I imagine they will arrest us for walking, said Ed Nixon one of the movement's chief planners. Of course, there's Ms. Rosa Parks, the one who started it all, the mother of the civil rights movement as related to transportation. She too was among the indicted. Her arrest on December 1st, 1955, for refusing to give up her seat to a white man, triggered the boycott. Abernathy was quoted as saying, we ain't scared of them anymore. The prayer of the day was, oh God, give us determined wills that we may be able to create and instill in the hearts of malignant forces in our land. That child for freedom and for justice. Oh yeah, let's not forget the then, the then, 27-year-old leading figure, the honoree of the hour, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., slain civil rights leader, pastor, and founder of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, called to court as well for his role in what I'll label effective leadership in the face of violence. A dream come true, a dream come true in the desegregation of public transportation. Before that, on April 3rd, 1948, in Jefferson, Georgia, terror attacks of the Ku Klux Klan failed to frighten Negroes away from the polls where they voted. Despite threats and the burning of large crosses, one young Negro veteran said that he wasn't afraid to die on the battlefield to protect the hides of the very clusters who would deny him the ballot. And he would not be afraid to die to protect his rights as a citizen. A dream come true for the right to vote. And just think, our very rights are being compromised and threatened as we speak. Yeah. Yeah. Lives were lost. Yeah. Yeah. Blood was shed. Yeah. People were being brutalized, yeah. fighting for the right to vote. Don't let their living, suffering, and dying be in vain. Don't let their living, their suffering, and 
right to vote exercise it. Don't be robbed of your ability. Don't be robbed of your right. Don't be robbed of your voice. Let it be heard. Let it be felt. Never to be ignored or disenfranchised again. Justice for the Scottsdale boy. Mass demonstrations and legal action. Efforts by the NAACP and International Labor Defense saved the lives of nine young black men who were arrested and charged with raping two white women. They were quickly convicted and sentenced to death by an all-white jury. The Supreme Court ordered a retrial for inadequate counsel. The defense lawyer spoke with them only a few minutes before trial began. A trial, a trial. And at that trial, one of the women, Ruby Bates, said that the entire case was a frame-up by authorities. And that she nor her friend Victoria Price had been attacked by the boys. Also, a white man was on the freight train at the time the alleged attacks were committed and swore that the charges were groundless. Black folks still being accused falsely and jailed unjustly. Dreams deferred yet continue, but dreams come true for justice. And we must realize that these dreams that are continued will come into fruition one day. And to be fully effective, we still must protest and fight. Fight for our rights. We still have to march for justice everywhere for people of color. In 1788, that was the year free black people organized the first African Baptist Church, originally named the Ethiopian Church of Jesus Christ in Savannah, Georgia. That's a dream come true, a dream come true, I tell you, in the freedom of religion. Yet religion seems to find herself on the ballot. 40 to 80 people, but I'm told in history, our history, it was more than that, were killed in the affluent black town of Rosewood, Florida. Black folks standing up to injustice, a dream realized for freedom of body, mind, and spirit. Survivors are yet accosted especially African Americans the world over, killed in the streets. We're killed in our homes. We're killed in our communities. We're killed in our sacred spaces, our churches. We're killed in our schools. But the dream continues. We rise from the ashes of this faith. We rise. Yes. We were shot from the rafters. Discrimination. 
peaceful protest. Even though the heinous acts of others with different agendas manages to sabotage those peaceful efforts. Yes, the dream continues because white men are now convicted and given lifetime sentences for killing our sons and our daughters. Yes, Dr. King preached a message of forgiveness and love while encountering violence himself along with the acts and efforts of C.T. Vivian and John Lewis and civil rights icons and others who were battered and bruised and abused yes. 